share your work and your journey. Uh, Thank you for having us. me. And uh, so I want to jump right in it with you. Um, and so I'm going to turn the screen over because I want to talk about the early days uh, in your in your life. We were discussing uh, heritage and your family. Um, and uh, so this image you shared with me uh, is really quite interesting because it has, of course, Fidel Castro's image, image of Puerto Rico, Dan Marino, music, all the things related to your youth and your story. Why don't we start there? Sure. Well, first, I want to um, ask everybody if they can hear us OK, because I hear you not so well. Um, so I just want to make sure. Can, can people hear us? Why don't I try this? Why don't I try getting some headphones or? Maybe a little it, sound check. Uh, is, is my voice coming through, folks? OK, we're getting we're, everybody can hear us, I guess. So that's good. That's good. All right. All right. So. All right, so I wanted to um, share a little bit about this image because this is kind of like a culmination of things that um, directly and indirectly affected uh, my life as a person, uh, as an artist also. Um, you have, um, my parents came from Cuba to the United States, to Miami originally, and then we moved to Puerto Rico. That happened because of the Cuban revolution. So you have Fidel Castro, um, you have an image in the center of the Cuban Revolution, mimicking Los Mambises from Cuba. On the opposite spectrum, you have Batista, which was the president of Cuba um, that was overthrown. Mariel Boatlift, which was the 1980 uh, exodus of over 300,000 Cubans. Around that time, the Dolphins were, you know, um, the big thing with, in the NFL. Dan Marino was a big quarterback. I was just moving to the United States from Puerto Rico. And as I was learning English, that was what was happening. Miami was in that prime time of the era of like Scarface, the movie Scarface was coming out. And musically, I had come from Puerto Rico. So we had a lot of influences of Cuban music, Puerto Rican, you know, um, salsa that was coming from New York. So you had Celia Cruz, the Fania record, you know, company. You had Tito Puente. Here I have Los Zafiros and Patata y Totico, which is some of the music that I personally love. So this is just some of the backdrop, the cultural backdrop that um, uh, I guess is part of who I am as a person and what would then um, illumine you know, my life in the United States. Miami in the 1980s, uh, my parents um, you know, had started there, but my father was offered to work in Puerto Rico, so we moved to Puerto Rico. And um, a lot of Cubans did that. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of Cubans in Puerto Rico and we were welcomed, uh, really lovely um, people in, in Puerto Rico. Our neighbors were great. Everybody treated us really nice. It was like this neighborly feeling of like, you know, you guys have just left an oppressive place. You know, welcome to Puerto Rico. You can see a picture of me there as a little, as a little kid on my bike. And um, this would like set up the backdrop again of, you know, having um, migrated and then moving to Miami again at the age of 10. Um, and it was the explosion of hip hop culture, right? This was, you know, 1983. This photograph here is actually a little bit later. I think this is 1986. And in the picture, you got Jess One, my boy Junior, JR, and uh, K, and myself. And we had a crew called International Kings of Art, IKOA, and VIP, the uh, <laughs> Vandals in Power. So this is really early days uh, when we were kids at a place um, called uh, Twin Lakes. It was like there was always in Miami, there was always like these abandoned construction sites that writers would take over and paint and paint right. walls. The, the pen, um, was, this a, was this a part of the penance? No, this was like the penance did exist at that time. And like for people who don't know what a penance is in, in Miami history, you know, people were writing on walls and painting walls and, and whatever we could get our hands on, like painting buses and, you know, the occasional train or rooftops. But there was this one thing that's unique to Miami, which was these abandoned buildings. There were a few throughout the city over the years, and we called them penance, which was short for penitentiary. It was like people thought they were like these abandoned under construction jail sites. Um, but they were probably just abandoned uh, you know, apartment buildings, but um, quickly, like hundreds and hundreds of writers would take over the walls and paint them. 
This is inside the, the place called the Pennant, which originally was really called the Graffiti Hall of Fame um, from people from my generation. This is in 1986. This was a really influential piece called Ghetto by a crew that I was a part of um, known as All the King's Men. And it was done by Micro and Miro, two, two artists that um, were influential to me. They were a little bit older. And you know, as so the culture goes, there was always somebody a little bit older that mentored the younger writers coming into the scene. And once you were a little bit older, you were then mentoring somebody younger. So that kind of um, rites of passage was always part of the culture. There was always like, you know, that old school saying, like each one teach one. And, um, and so this is the, the, the artistic and cultural backdrop. Um, for those of you guys that are just joining, this is the backdrop that would, um, you know, illuminate my understanding of um, the United States culture. Because you see, I was coming from Puerto Rico. We didn't have the trains like New York and all the walls like in Miami being pieced up and painted. So as I started to acclimate and sort of go through the culture shock of coming to a new country, learning the English language, I was learning it through writing culture and, and hip hop culture because for me at that time, it was all one, it was the early 80s. And so it was a major explosion of hip hop culture on the scene in South Miami where I was from. I, I was basically learning, um, you know, directly from older artists and dancers and DJs and things that were really happening around the neighborhood. And so as you were developing as an artist, you know, who were the style influencers? Who was really kind of being so influential on you uh, in terms of your style aesthetic? Well, at that time, you know, I was really influenced by local writers uh, in, in Miami. And um, first, it was like we were discovering neighborhoods of writers that we didn't know existed because we were so young. I mean, you're talking about I was 10 years old. And the guys that were teaching me, they were like 12, 13, and 14 years old. And they looked up to some guys that were maybe like 16 and 18. So, but we were all under 18 pretty much. And um, one of the first writers that really influenced uh, my, my brother and I was a writer named Jess One um, from Cutler Ridge down South Miami. And Jess would introduce us to other writers like Try and Ache Love, Ask, from a crew called um, All the All Toys Blackout, Mess One, and eventually we were down South Miami, but we eventually moved to West Miami, where it was this area of the Hall of Fame. And during that time, my brother and I were kind of introducing a lot of the Southern Miami writers to writers that were coming from North Miami or downtown. So at that time. I remember meeting artists like Seam, who's probably on here from VO5 crew and Dash, Sar, rest in peace from Alive 5. So you had like this very local Miami scene that was very influential to me. Around 1984 or 85, I remember seeing for the first time, you know, everybody was going to the movie theaters to see like Beat Street and things like, and then on PBS you had Style Wars, which was like massive for us because before we had come to New York, and I speak, speak as we because a, a large group of us hadn't been to New York yet. We got to see New York through Henry Chalfant and Tony Silver's documentary, Style Wars. And then shortly thereafter, there was the book um, by Martha Cooper and Henry Chalfant, Subway Art, which really like allowed us to see all the pictures of the trains that were painted from the early days. And we got more of the, you know, like the beef and potatoes of the history of where it started, who started it from Philadelphia, you know, like Cornbread and Taki 183 in New York. And, you know, Case 2 was a big influence. Don, the scene, all these writers, uh, you know, Lady Pink, Lee Quinones, all these, Futura was a really huge influence. And so you have this one school that I was a part of, which was being a writer and being part of um, that community that was, you know, heavily influenced by the bedrock of hip hop culture. One of the things I am appreciating about what you were just talking about is the reverence and the memory you have of names and people. Uh, I don't know how common that is amongst artists, but I know amongst graffiti artists, 
There's something about uh, the recollection of names that are tied to places. Um, and so I, I appreciate that about the conversation and you paying reverence to those old pioneers in your community, uh, not right. just New York. Um, and yeah. so you're, de you're developing as a painter. And the image we're looking at now is, is interesting. You're really fully developed and realized as a painter at this point. Uh, tell me about your trajectory uh, as an artist at this point. Okay, so, you know, throughout the years, I was always um, painting on walls and canvases and keeping sketchbooks. To me, I didn't see much of a, of a sort of um, difference, like art was art to me. And, um, you know, you try to, I'm trying to put into context the fact that I was a kid and that ad adults always um, tried to kind of classify and, and sort of pigeonhole what we were doing by saying things like, you know, that's not art, you should evolve and, and become a painter, become an artist. But all, all the while I had already put in, you know, a good five, six, seven to 10 years of painting huge murals, walls, both illegal and legal, keeping sketchbooks. I always had canvases laying around doing canvases. I was painting people's jackets. What, what so were I had a very thinking? active, sorry? What were your parents thinking about all of this? <laughs> you know, it's interesting because of course they knew like we could get in a lot of trouble, not only because the art form itself was illegal, but the surroundings were really dangerous. We're talking about Miami in the 1980s and there was a lot of street gangs and violence. And, you know, it was like that 1980s of, you know, Miami Vice and that element of violence was there. So of course parents worried, but we were lucky that my, my mom and dad, they were, you know, I think they were really supportive. They said things to us like, don't give up. And, you know, if you believe in your art, do it. My dad sometimes would call me ease just to goof around. And my mom would be like, don't, don't call him that, you know, and, and stuff like that. But they were cool. And, um, you know, during that time that I was painting that mural, you're asking, I was already keeping a studio. Um, by the age that I was 15, I had gotten the Scholastic Art Award uh, and won a prize in that competition, which would eventually land me in college. So I was experimenting and I was also influenced by my brother who was experimenting with painting on film and, um, and scratching on film and taking photographs. So we were really into documenting and keeping pictures and sketchbooks and canvases and at the same time going out and painting walls. So we were doing all these things at the same time. You were mentioned to me how influential your parents were in terms of connecting you to uh, history, making you more curious about history and culture. And yeah. uh, you shared with me these, these slides of, yeah. of, of, of what they were talking about. Sure. Well, early on, you know, I, I remember um, telling my father that I had discovered this book at a, in a friend's um, garage. It was the, the early version uh, of a book titled Watching My Name Go By by John Narr with an essay by Norman Mailer. I brought it home and I was super excited. I talked to my dad about it. And I didn't, you know, I was 15 years old or something, and I didn't really understand a lot of what was going on with the essay, but I, I got the knack of it. And he, my father uh, encouraged me to look deeper into art history, going all the way back to the cave paintings. And so researching back in those days, it was, it was not like Google, you know, where you could just like do everything easily. We were actually going through the Dewey system at, the, at your public library and or, or at the school library. And I came across images like this shell is, is, is something that predates um, the cave paintings. The cave paintings, the, some of the oldest ones are probably like between 50 to 75,000 years old um, before Christ. Uh, but this shell actually goes back even further. It goes to about five, 540,000 years ago. Scientists think that it was um, our ancestors, the, the Homo erectus, it, they say it's one of the first abstractions. It's a shell. They probably had tools to dig up the oysters, to eat the oysters. But they, they're, they're assuming, and, and, and maybe there's a theory that while doing that, one of the sharp tools that the Homo erectus had 
they started to doodle or to, or to make these cross hatching, they call it a cross hatch on this shell. So it kind of gives the inclination to imagine that <clears throat> our ancestors before Homo sapiens, that even the older versions of ourselves were already starting to think visually and constructing language. And that really inspired me to connect to the ideas of, of us as like modern day dwellers and, and, and artists needing to make a mark, not in the like um, traditional sense of, you know, the academia and just painting canvases and following that, but we were kind of breaking through that and doing things our own way as a community that was in the fringes of society and wanting to, to, to exist. Like I love this, this image here. This image is in Argentina in a cave from about 13,000 years ago. And why I love this one is because it's all these hands, all these people, this multitude. And this multitude of people um, in layers of what is crushed pigment, right? So, so imagine making pigments from leaves and, and, and rocks and flowers and things like that. And then um, putting your hand up on the wall of this cave and using it as a stencil and spitting on the wall, making the saliva go, yeah. be kind of the glue on the wall. And then they're spraying all of the mist of the pigment onto the wall. So this is like early spray painting in a sense. I mean, I connected to those things because of my father and my mother, you know, <clears throat> giving us the, the, the sort of, encouragement to do research and to and to learn about the roots of of art history and so i went all the way back yeah it, it's fascinating when we do the research and find the correlations it, it makes it all the more exciting and and makes our work seem more relevant in in the act of uh, in, in our own human nature isn't it yeah no definitely definitely and and you know it's you get encouraging feelings from you know all kinds of people in your life when you're you know, one of the things I remember is like when you're doing something in your black book and you want to go and make something on a, on a wall and it's at night and you got to practice your colors, you got to memorize everything. That was similar to being in a cave. I remember, I imagine that back then when they were painting caves, they must, they must have been working with, with torch lights and, and fire to, to light up the, the wall working in the dark. And we, we had, you know, whatever little bit of light there was, you know, wherever we were in a tunnel or, or moonlight or some distant street light or, or whatever. But the case was to always make the work that we were doing was to make it better each time. And, you know, for me, it was encouraging to have friends that were older artists uh, around me. Like, you know, I remember one of the earliest pieces, you know, I was, I would do like jackets and things like that and sell them at school, like, for Valentine's Day and get a little money. And that was encouraging. But I remember, and I see a comment on here, one of the artists that really encouraged me early on was my, my homeboy, um, Seam from VO5 crew. He's known as Arrive Arts now. He bought one of my earliest drawings. And to me, that was a huge honor because he was an artist that I really looked up to a lot. So for him to, he, he, like, he said, look, I wanna buy that from you. And I, I, I was so young at that time, I, I would have probably just given it to him, but he insisted in buying it, which was really um, that camaraderie, you know, like that, that support, that was something special also. So you have support systems that are kind of part of like um, the culture from your parents to your peers to older artists that, you yes. know. That's a, good, you that's a good segue into the kind of support you would get once you get to Savannah, right? We were discussing this, what university was like. You were already thinking broadly you were already experimenting. And mm. uh, again, you commit to your art and you go to a, a very good art school. Tell us about that, about those early years. Well, to get to this point, I want to tell you a little story before that. I was pretty young when I went to um, SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. I was only 15 years old in the summer of 1989. And, um, you know, b before that, I was a 10th grader. I never finished high school. What had happened was that, you know, during that year in high school, we used to go to a place a lot of people from Miami might know about from the 80s called Hot Wheels. It was, um, you know, where, where you would go roller skating and there was all these like hip hop concerts. And on one night we went to see a, an amazing crew from out of Philly called Tough Crew. 
they had a, they had their record had just come out and everybody was going and I was really into b-boying so I was break dancing heavily at the same time that I was painting and interested in art um, but you know I was like kind of skipping school a lot and like just going to Miami Beach and going fishing with friends and painting on walls underneath the, the boardwalk and just hanging out really like my parents were like you know get your act together get to school but during that time, I was goofing around a lot and going out and break dancing. Um, and what had happened was my school teacher started an after school program for like the kind of kids that she wanted to mentor more and like give us more attention because we were not at school most of the day. And uh, because of that, she entered my unfinished drawing, which at that time I had done this burner on a billboard like you know not a billboard like a illustration board you know like with designers and, and those kind of markers it said graffiti city and um she entered it at the scholastic art awards and i won the nationals went to boston that year 1988 and then eventually colleges offered different scholarships and i i went to scad and um i remember thinking you know it was the opposite of miami it was it was not a tropical place it was more old uh, in terms of architecture and had these beautiful mossy trees and little parks. It's, it's a really quaint, beautiful town, but it's a Southern city, you know, and it was very black and white. There was like no Hispanics there. I was, me and another uh, student were the only like Latin students in the whole school. So it took me some time to get used to it. And, um, but it was a really great school and I learned a lot. Well, were you already a, thinking, were, were, sorry to interrupt, but were you already thinking of a major? Were you thinking like, well, maybe I'll go and yeah. be a, an illustrator or an engineer? No, what, I what? wanted to be, I wanted to study painting. I always yeah. wanted to be a, a, a painter. I, I probably told that to my mother since I was like 10 years old. I, I, I saw, I, I showed her a book of Picasso and I, and I said to her, you know, mom, I want to do what this guy does. So I was really into painting. And I went to SCAD for painting and there was a lot of challenges because you got to remember it's the end of the eighties and you know, the kind of art that we were doing on walls was getting a lot of bad publicity. It was like vandalism. It was a crime. It was illegal. So you bring that to college and they were like, no, that's not art. Right. And you got to defend your ideas. You had to defend, I had to defend my ideas. And a, a, a lot of what I went through was, um, painting, but also doing research in order to have those conversations with older students and professors. And I'm still just 16, you know, turning 16 years old. So I was the youngest kid at the whole school. And, um, and I had literally just transformed my life. I was like from the streets of Miami, hanging out with writers. I spoke a different way. I was a certain style of like person. I was kind of still in the 80s, you know what I'm saying? Because I was a b-boy and everybody was into something, you know, it was like skate culture was taking over, punk rock. It was just very diverse, which, which I welcomed, you know, and I became a part of. But in one of my painting classes, um, I tried to introduce the ideas of deteriorated walls with textures and writing and, and um and the kind of painting that I was interested in. And the teacher said to me that, no, that, that belonged in the trash, that it didn't belong in painting. And I went to the um, school library. I got out of class. And um, in that school library, there was a black and white photographic show of pictures of the New York Soho streets by Robert Rauschenberg. And I hadn't heard of Rauschenberg yet but I was really taken by the photographs. And, um, you know, there were like pictures of trash, deteriorated sections of walls, a broken stop sign, uh, a dilapidated restaurant building, things like that. Um, and some of these, you have some of these images on here with one of his paintings, but mm -hmm. one of the images that, that, that struck me was a picture that Rauschenberg took of Cy, Cy Twombly. This I also did, yeah. I also didn't know who Cy Twombly was at the time. And, but I was, I was really moved by it because I was peering into the small, I mean, the photograph was like this little, you know? So I was peering into this world through this little black and white photograph at someone who was like going over and over and over and over again with what seemed to be like, like you know, like tags, like 
just writing and and I loved it and so I did more research on those guys and I found also artists like Antoni Tapias and uh, Mark Toby and I brought those books back up to my art teacher and uh, you know that started the dialogue and the kind of respect that he saw that I was really into um, what I was trying to portray in my painting. And, you know, of course I had maturing to do, but that was the kind of foundation of what led me to, to, to think about like, if I'm a writer and what I do is writing, then it makes perfect sense to sort of um, study and align myself with the kind of abstract expressionists. Right, and we could see here I, I, the correlation in your black book tags, uh, what was to come, but also if we go back to Twom, uh, Cy Twombly, you yeah. know, that, that is in a similar fashion in a way, in its yeah. energy, let's just say. Well, uh, you know, what's, what's interesting is this predates me knowing about Twombly. This was just an old black book from 1987 where I had listed the, the, the writers that I was painting with and hanging out with at that time. So I always kept it because first it's a record of that time. It's, it's a document of names of people, writers. And, and uh, we were all young artists, really. But it also always ties me back to that discovery of artists like Cy Twombly, Mark Toby, Tapias, and, and so on. Right. And, so forth. And, and these are themes that played out over the last uh, 20 years for you. And another yeah. point of reference for you that's very important is Rotella. Uh, yeah. And uh, tell us, do you have a great story behind, uh, you know, your, your show in Italy, but his work, how, how did his work influence you? Well, you know, so the interesting thing is, so when I was um, interested in this kind of uh, uh, painting of bringing the city onto the canvas, it was because, first I have to tell you about photography a little bit. I used to always take photographs with my brother. My brother was taking pictures of everything in Miami and carrying a camera everywhere. And so he kind of got me into it. And uh, I would take photographs of walls and try to replicate that on canvas. I was not aware of this having happened in the 1950s with Rotella, Mimo Rotella from Italy, or Jacques Viegle from um, uh, France in Paris. So. I was just doing this because I wanted to preserve something that was tangible, that was made out of paint, that was made out of tactile, handmade effort, and that it wasn't just a photograph because a photograph was something else of a place that would no longer exist eventually, right? It was the ephemeral. Right. So discovering many years later, Mimo Rotella, it was because I was on a trip uh, to London and I went to the Tate Britain to see a painting show um, and I, I ran on, you know, basically bumped into a Rotella painting and it blew my mind. I thought, wow, this is incredible. That was the same year that I was invited by curator Manon Sloan, who's now the curator that did my show at the Bronx Museum. She invited me to do a show at the Chelsea Art Museum at the time that was um, a show with Mimo Rotella and myself, which was mind blowing because at that time I was probably That's like- incredible like 23 or 24 years old, and I did a, a painting titled Tremont Avenue. Oh, which, well, which we so do this have. Painting, yeah, yeah. So what? this predates that. So that, that next painting that you have is one that I did in Italy uh, a few years, few years ago by collecting all the elements of posters uh, from all around the southern part of Italy, Reggio Calabria and Taranto, Italy, where Mimo Rotella is from. So this was an homage to, to his work, really, um, and making this kind of decollage uh, work where you could see it's very different than some of the other work that I've done that has lots of layers of signatures and writing and, and uh, textures. So Jose, this, this, this whole, because I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of this, this kind of journey that artists have with other artists, the dialogue, right? The unspoken dialogue, the, the um, uh, kind of inheritance of history, let's just say, and how we in reinterpret it, you know, because now at this point, you're in university and you're working it out, you're learning art history, uh, you're applying it. Um, but then you, you know, from Savannah, you end up coming to New York, right? Yeah. And yeah. you have direct contact with a very important person, painter, legendary painter, case two. 
Yeah. Uh, but it, this, this was a very important meeting for you uh, yeah. as an artist. Tell us about this. So um, I had just moved to New York in about 1996. I moved to the Bronx. And um, at that time, I had, a, I had an apartment in the Wakefield area of the Bronx. And I was meeting a, a lot of different writers and painting with a lot of different writers. And I had my first studio outside of the Bronx in New Rochelle. Around that time, I was introduced to Case 2 um, by hanging out with like UW crew, which was like King B and those guys and Bomb 5 and um, MW and uh, Cope was around. I remember like I met Inc. 76 from Brooklyn and Sonic. So there were these really legendary New York writers that took me under their wing, in particular Case 2, because I was living in the Bronx and I was really close to him. So we were painting a lot of walls. Me, him, Shy from the Inkheads, which is another really great friend of ours. Um, and we painted the Hall of Fame. We painted in Queens and Brooklyn. We did canvases together. We spent a lot of time. Uh, he kind of mentored me into the New York scene. And during that time, between 96 and 99, it was an interesting period because around 98, I was also with my friend News from Inkheads crew and Edek. And we were doing shows in the Lower East Side, you know, in like late 97, 98, around the time that A-Life was opening, you know, some people out there know what I'm talking about. That period was really interesting in New York because it was kind of like this re-sparking of doing, you know, these underground shows that were not necessarily like depict as graffiti shows or urban shows. We were just really experimenting, doing all kinds of things. But we were doing things with music, like bringing DJs to do experimenting. I mean, like Bobito was part of this back in those days. And we had these uh, friends from Tokyo, Yuta Man and Sir and um, Tomoko and this, this crew, they said, let's go to Japan and do this. So at the same time, we were doing things in the Bronx and the Lower East Side, we landed in Japan, you know? And we, we're in Tokyo, and that's when I met Futura. I met Futura and Stash out in Tokyo around 1998, 99. And I was, you know, all the time I was, make, I was keeping black books and still writing. We, were, we even painted trains in Japan and painted walls out there. But at the same time, we were doing exhibitions in Tokyo as well. I went out there. One time, um, our friend Rage was with me. We did an exhibition um, that traveled from Tokyo to Osaka. And we had like seven or eight DJs lined up with turntables all hooked up so that we could all do, um, you know, all kinds of experimental music and mixing. And we were just not only about painting and, and, and art, but we were doing all kinds of really uh, outlandish things that we just were interested in doing. And what was your painting look? What, what kind of form was your painting starting to take at that period? Um, well, I guess you could go through some of the, 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 the slides, but some of the paintings were, one of the earliest shows that I did in New York was at a bar called Bob, which was pretty legendary because you had like, you know, Lee Quinones that just did a show there and I was really um, inspired by him. Um, and those Gemmills were doing shows down the street with Tokion and Barry McGee twist had just done a show at the drawing center and so there was all this stuff that was like I, I would say like the next generation like we were coming out you know um and like Todd James Espo and Barry had just done you know the street market show in Philadelphia and all these really great things and my paintings were um I think at that time from the whole group my paintings were the ones that resembled an old wall a wall with uh, writing and, 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 and layers of chipping paint and, and the, the past lives of the wear and tear of what are the traces of people. Something like what you're looking at right now on the screen, which was a part of the wall series that I was doing. This was actually a painting titled Tremont Ave, and it's on the cover of a Haji Khan's publication of my work. Um, this was in 2004. And it was 
a show that was with Mimo Rotella. But what's interesting about this painting is you could see some of the tags like Ask, Name 189, Eric, some of the writers from Miami that were influential. But for example, Ket, one of the founders of the Museum of Graffiti, who's a dear friend to all of us, I would say, yo, come through the museum. And I, you know, he took tags on, on the painting, Tracy 168, Stay wow. High 149, Case 2. So now the paintings actually had um, marks made by other people, what I would call like other actors, you know, like the way you would invite characters onto a play or onto a movie. These, these paintings really were about life and real life. That's why here I incorporated this, cell, this, this um, uh, old payphone, which I had found in the Bronx and you could see that it's not hung up. It's like dangling down, like if somebody had to break out and a coffee cup on the top. And then there's like little posters in different languages in Spanish and Chinese, you know, like those kind of little advertisings that you might find on poles and things everywhere. So I was really, the dialogue wasn't, for me, the dialogue wasn't just limited to writers, writing culture or just the underground. There was always this social aspect to my work. There was always, an aspect of where we're from and what environment we're in is falling apart. It's deteriorating because of a lot of different reasons, right? And we can go into the politics of it, but the background that I wanted to show in these paintings was that there was neglect and that there was pain. So some of my earlier paintings, like the ones you're looking at now, are darker. It was a darker period. Um, a lot of black and white writing, a lot of layering is because at that time, I was still really active painting tunnels and going into the pirate stations, you know, like with my boy News and, and Sir. And when you're in the dark tunnels, the only thing you see is like those little, the light bulbs every once in a while and the writing and the textures around the light. So I was emphasizing that and I was really influenced actually by Revs. Some people know him as Revlon from uh, Brooklyn. Revs and Cost, you know, they took over the city at this time, you know? So you saw like Revs and Cost everywhere. Yeah. And uh, I think that were some of my favorite and some of the earliest ones who really like took over the streets with an original form of plastering and pasting and postering and doing names and artworks that were just really incredible. But the thing about Revs is that Revs in the tunnels would write poetry, just dark black tunnels, and he would write with white spray paint, all types of poetry, you know? And I, I used to run into his stuff when you go in tunnels and you say, wow, look at this thing. This guy's in the middle of this tunnel. He wrote a whole poem. And that was really interesting to me, you know, the way that like I could, you know, be influenced by someone like Cy Twombly and Revs to do the kind of work that I was interested in, do in doing, you know? Right, and but what's interesting about these works, as you know, as your book title implies, that they are diaries. Um, yeah. I, I think so much of, and uh, again, from the beginning of this conversation, is about this recollection of memory of people and places that uh, are embedded into the experience of, the, of your life, but also in the work. You continue yeah. that throughout, you know, your whole process. But also something yeah. else starts to happen, the kind of action painting, the kind of uh, yeah. uh, movement that, um, it, you know, takes years to master. Uh, but at this point, it, again, it's kind of your subconscious is taking over really heavily on these works. Well, you know, like this one that you're looking at is titled The Founders. And it's actually a 2020 work that I made for the uh, Bronx Museum of, of the Arts. And it's titled The Founders because I paid homage to your generation. There's a Mayor 139 in there. Um, there's a Futura 2000, Shy 147. I see a there's Kel. Space I see a Mary Kel. Yeah, there's Kel. I mean, like, there's Nick 707, Dome. So, so why, Quick, is you know, why is reverence so important to you? Why is that so important in your work to, to kind of pull these names into your, back into existence in your work? Well, you know why? It's because of style. Style is passed down. And these sty this, this style of painting is not just so much about writing and writing anything and writing just for the sake of writing. But the style is passed down to me. And these are very stylistic forms in terms of the hand style, the calligraphy. 
uh, aspect is very important to me. And it's not something that I invented. It, it was passed down from writer to writer to writer to writer. It spread. It was like this beautiful thing that it's a phenomenon. I don't think that I'm capable of explaining it, but writers know. And, you know, um, I think it's happened throughout art history that there's always this expansions and this, you know, um, giving, you know, and so not forgetting is just equally as important. And so paying homage to the, to those who came before me, for me has always been really important. Plus it allows me to, um, it allows me to practice something that I love. And one of the things that I love is making lists. I love to write the names of people, the, the, the names of influences. It's a way to remember those, you know, and I, I don't think it's exclusive to writing culture and to being who I am. I think paying homage to those who came before us is basic, it's basic humanity. It's something that most indigenous tribes and religions do, you know, throughout history, you know? Hey, and so, me, yeah. Let, let me ask you something. In this painting, The Nature of Language, this one you did at North Carolina. Oh, no, this, this I'm was, sorry, uh, The Nature of Language is the red and no, white this one's one. This is schematic, right? This is schematic diagram of cryptography. I'm yeah. sorry, I missed that. Um, in here, it's very interesting because I had asked you about the trailing off of the tag. And yeah. you made two important references to, with this. So could you elaborate on that? Well, so the title of this one is crazy because it's, um, it's about cryptography. And what I thought about language is how writers, we created an underground system of style to communicate with one another, which was, you know, kind of a secret language. And I love that because I thought we deserved that being that we were pushed aside as like part of the fringes of society. So that's one thing. The other thing is that I was also now paying roots to, um, <laughs> Futura said jellyfish. <laughs> but you know what? This pays homage to Philadelphia. It has some of the long Philly style writing and some of the swerves and, and, and loops that Miami also um, took on uh, from, I think, Philly, you know, a, a little bit. Um, but, you know, we're all East Coast writers, so there's a lot of influence in, in there. Yes. But in particular, what you're asking about, the, the kind of long trailing writing, that's, that's influenced by Philly. Yeah, and then, because uh, I jumped ahead, one of the questions I had about the nature of language um, oh. at the, uh, the University of North Carolina, when you take this language into public space, um, mm the the what's the impression people have of it well so this is a really um special commission that i was really privileged to have i was invited by an architecture firm uh from norway and new york called snoheta my friend craig dykers and i got to know each other through speaking about art and design and architecture and he told me right away look i have a project that might be suited for you and um it was a library uh, that was really special. It's a research library in, in um, North Carolina. And, um, you know, it's got 3 million books in a robotic system, okay, so that it, it's housed separate from the open spaces of the library. So it's a kind of library of the future. You know, from our generation, libraries were like these quiet places with tons of hallways with books everywhere, and you have to be quiet. This futuristic libraries are not about being quiet there. They are about bringing people and community together. They're about encouraging conversation and um, learning, communal learning. And, um, and if you want privacy and silence, you have rooms like that as well. Um, but I just kept thinking, what kind of work would I do for a commission like this? Mm. And so I wanted to pick, whoops. <laughs> Can you guys see me? Yeah. I dropped this thing. Um, we're back. We're back. Can you can you hear yeah, me all right? You're good. Okay, so check it out. I wanted to pay homage to the history of languages, and that's a really crazy thing because <laughs> language, you know, goes back before it was even something that could be written. Okay, and and sometimes language is as old as older than something that could be spoken. Okay, because languages. Uh, could be as early as clicking sounds and whistling sounds um, and all types of different, you know, uh, phonetics and, and, and 
and theories of what language could be. So all of those and how they're named, I decided to do a list of that. So this is kind of a, an ocean or a landscape of names of languages, the places where languages come from, the places where um, uh, they travel to, their expansion, the names of people who invented languages and so on and so forth. It's like this massive, um, so, and so for sure, and, right. and for and sure it's not finished. Right, in your research for this, in terms of, the, of, of what you were gonna apply, you said you, you, you wrote names and languages on this. Um, how, what you retain, did you retain notes for that or did, was that just yeah. memory? Yeah, I, I write everything down in notebooks. And so wh while I was painting this, I should have given you a picture, but while I was painting this, I would work from the notebook onto the mural. And um, there's a film actually, if you guys Google nature of language, Jose Parla, and click on video, there's a small video that my brother made um, with Radical Media of the making of this. So you can check that out if you guys are interested. So we're gonna move into a new space. one of the things that's nice is already, cause your mind is, is broadening, your ideas of, of the world have been broadening over the years and you've been traveling a lot. And uh, I pulled up this quote, the real voyage of discovery consists not of in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes by Marcel Proust. And that to me speaks truly of this journey, right? Of how you're seeing the world anew uh, yeah. and how that's affecting your work, how culture and, and practices, uh, creative practices and tr uh, around the world are, are available to you. Uh, so you go to Japan and you start, yeah. playing, you, you, you start doing some ceramics um, with the, it, Ichigo, I'm, I'm screwing up. You better say the, the name. I can't pronounce it correctly. I, I apologize. The, so the, this is the Kimura family uh, from Ichiyo Gura. They're in, in um, the south of Japan, southwest Bizen area. And they're one of the oldest families to do um, kilns and ceramics in Japan dating back a thousand years. Um, I met them through some friends from Okayama in Tokyo that I had been working with known as Bao, my friend Eda, and Kaba and Tanushi. And those guys were just amazing. They, they're actually making design and clothing. And we had done one collaboration and they put together my first exhibition ever in Tokyo of my paintings. Um, during that trip, they said, hey, you know, we should go to my hometown because there's somebody that we would love for you to meet. And we, we went down to Okayama and you could see in the picture, there's a young man on, on the lower right. That's my friend Hajime whose family had been doing the ceramics for a really long time. And during that time, um, we got to know each other and we scheduled for me to come back so that I could learn how to work with this very traditional ceramic. And um, it was just expansing, expansive for me because imagine going to Japan, which they have such a deep history of calligraphy, of the, you know, uh, masters of, uh, calligraphy and, and using the brush in a poetic way. But then I was also thinking about the cuneiform and, yep. and work that had been inscribed onto stone in, in prehistory. And I wanted to bring our culture, the culture of writers onto this kind of, uh, again, um, naming reference to something historic, you know, and so a lot, of, a lot of what you see here are documents. Again, they're the names of writers from New York, writers from Miami, people that I had come in contact with, and um, especially the stressing the surface of this ceramics and cutting them in certain ways that it would look like an ancient find, something that you had found somewhere. Um, and yes. yeah. But this, this one is different though. This, mm. this work from that period, tell me about this, this work in the process? Yeah. Well, so some of these are um, made with water and pigment and straight pigment. These pigments are uh, some uh, crushed elements of paint that I, that I made with a, a, um, an alchemist in the Appalachian Mountains outside of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I wanted to find a way to introduce our style of writing meaning like the style writing, um, but that it had some kind of connection to works that I kept seeing in Asia, not only in 
Japan and China, but also in the Middle East, okay? But then not interested in showing it in black and white. I wanted color and I wanted texture. So um, the process of this was just very experimental way to show our hand styles that you usually see on a wall or done with marker or, or, or something like that. But I wanted it to do it in a traditional parchment paper. And so I worked with water with a thick brush, almost like a uni wide. And from above, I would drop uh, the pigment, which is thin powder dust. You have to wear a mask. And, uh, and it would just basically, uh, this was set, you know, you could read it, it says Zen, Z-E-N. And a lot of these I would do over and over in a kind of meditative contemplation of the style. They're really simple forms. These are not that complicated, but I really like the outlook. Uh, sorry, the outcome of how they worked out. Yeah, this one in particular looks very Arabic in, in its way, uh, cut from an Arabic uh, writing. Um, folks, I, Jose, I'm going to let people know that um, we are going to go into part two of our conversation because we still have some more to, to cover with you. The uh, time so flies. I, I have, it's been amazing so far. Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I love the arc that's taking shape here in terms of your journey uh, as an artist, as a writer, but also as a, a, a global citizen, you know, that you are embracing the world and the world's cultures and allowing that to affect you as a human being and as an artist. And it's reflective in your work. It's reflective in your personality uh, and in your intellect. So uh, it, it's, it's such a wonderful inspiration for all of us to see uh, the effects of something so simple as writing your name and how Thank it's you. giving you the world. So folks, we're going we're, we're gonna to log off for a minute and we're going to re-log on. So please stay on board with us uh, for part two. Come back, y'all. Jose Mills, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's there. All right, so I'll see you in what? Should we like restart now? Yeah, in just a minute. Let me just log off, save, and, and I'll come right back on. Okay, take your time. Take your time.